Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. I'm delighted to welcome the award-winning journalist Lucinda Franks to the program today. The author of countless articles and a wonderful memoir of her father, she gets up close and very personal with her latest book, Timeless Love, Morgenthau and Me, an account of her unlikely courtship with and marriage to Robert M. Morgenthau, the longtime former Manhattan District Attorney and scion of a prestigious and accomplished New York family. The book has just been published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud. It is still very much a romance between the two of them. But what brought the 26-year-old former war protester and true child of the 60s together with the 53-year-old prosecutor and widower with five children? And what has kept them together for more than 30 years? I'll leave the telling of that tale to her. Welcome. Well, well thank you so much. <laughs> You know, there are some marriages that everybody seems to know about. Um, everybody seems to have heard of them. I mean, I think of Sally Quinn and Ben Bradley. I think of Norris Church and Norman Mailer, and certainly your marriage to, to Robert Morgenthau. I guess in each case, I mean, for some reasons, because it was a big age difference, um, because you're a power couple, um, and because, you know, many people, it came as a shock to many people. It seemed unlikely. Is the, is the reason you wrote the book to show that, in fact, it was the perfect match? Not at all. In fact, quite the opposite. I, I am married to one of the great men of our era. And what people know of him is that he is a staunch, tough, slightly intimidating prosecutor. He's never talked to the public about his personal life. He was ready to, and I wanted to make him a whole person. With You read this book, and you will find out the weaknesses, the foibles, the goofiness, the uh, every side of him that you could possibly not know by listening to him on the television. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this was a... Uh... So maybe a backhanded way of writing his memoir without him having to do it, getting him well, to do it. Well, I'm in there too. <laughs> well, you are. You are definitely in there. You're definitely right. Right. The two of you met when you were 26 and he was 53. Uh, when you interviewed him for an expose that you were writing for UPI uh, on then President Richard Nixon, correct? Um, I gather his first impression of you wasn't too good. What about your first impression of him? I was sitting there asking very detailed questions, as I usually do, uh, which were, was getting on his nerves. I could tell, but I, I couldn't stop looking at this magnificent forehead he had. I'd never seen anything like it. He, uh, in turn, was looking at this weird poncho, hippie poncho, that I had that he couldn't get out of his mind. Uh, but he thought I was the dumbest or the smartest reporter he had ever met. And after he read my story, he decided I was the smartest. Now, I was doing a lot of things that were on this side of the law. I was throwing blood on draft files with groups of people, chaining myself to the White House fence, doing everything I could to stop the Vietnam War. Bob Morgenthau could have put me in jail. You were in fact living, were you living with a draft dodger? I was. You were, okay. I was. He could have put me in jail, but instead he asked me out on a date. Uh, this date was, uh, <laughs> it, you have to read it in the book because it was very funny and very um, counterintuitive to who, Bob Morgenthau is, but uh, after that, we were just inseparable. In fact, after that first, he, he loved that, for, that story that you wrote, and he began feeding you other stories, in fact. Well, he, he did. Uh, he, um, I was with the New York Times, and he became a source, because I later found out that was the only way he could get a hold of me because if he called me at home, 
the draft dodger I was with, would not let me talk to him and would not tell me he had called because he wanted me to write my book on deserters. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the only reason. Might have been other reasons too. But uh, when I was at, U at New York Times, I had a phone and he could call me. And he called me frequently with tips for stories. I, in turn, did stories that were useful to him, you know, not in any way compromising uh, to me, but good stories. Do you think he was partly attracted to the fact that you were this star reporter for the New York Times? Is that part of it? I think part of it was that, and I think he couldn't get the uh, hippie poncho out of his <laughs> mind. Uh, you know, I think there are symbols of things in people. Right. And when we think about those people, we think about the nose or the, you know, the hair or what they wore, the high heels, whatever. And uh, I think uh, he, he really couldn't get that part of me out of his mind. And he really wanted to ask me on a date. And he didn't dare. So it was the day before I was leaving uh, to go to Telluride to join the draft dodger that he called me and asked me on this date. And it was at the, it was a party at the home of Arthur Schlesinger, uh, a rather star-studded affair, it turned out. Uh, were you somewhat titillated by the fact that um, he introduced you to this star-studded world? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I thought it was the most ghastly thing I had ever seen. You know, women in feather boas coiled around their necks as thin as swans. Uh, I just, I was in my bell bottoms and my vest and my platform shoes. I had never been to anything like this as a guest. And it, it just intimidated me terribly. Uh, and I was saved uh, because people were staring at me. And they were asking if I worked for Mr. Morgenthau. And I was saved by the entry of Jackie Kennedy into the door, through the door. And everybody, these sophisticated women, their jaws dropped. They stared and smiled at Jackie. I looked up at Bob, and he was smiling too, but not at Jackie. Was part of your attraction to him was that somebody who had been this kind of rebel, war protester, pouring blood on government files, somebody who sort of living somewhat on the edge. Was there this attraction to somebody who, who was a, a pillar of mainstream stability? Was that part of it? You know, this is very complicated. Uh, the anti-war movement was, we were as one. We had one goal, and that was to stop the war and to change the culture. There was not loyalty between people. There was not uh, monogamy between people. There were no moral values that we had grown up with because we wanted to destroy everything our parents represented. Right. I think everyone got tired of this because that's not the way human beings are supposed to live. And when I met Bob and found out that without screaming, you know, against the culture, he could change things under the radar. I began to admire him, and I also began to be very attracted to the stability and the security and the loyalty he offered. Mm -hmm. He was a real human being that could change the system from within. Now, he came from a very illustrious German-Jewish family, well-educated. His grandfather was an ambassador. His father was secretary uh, of the treasurer, of the treasury under FDR. Um, your family, while not Jewish, was also upper, upper middle class. You were a debutante. <laughs> Please don't I'm going to tell. That. that is public <laughs> now. Both of you went to elite colleges. So... Were your families, your childhoods, that different, or were they a lot alike? Well, they, differ they were different and they were alike. 
there were no Jews in Wellesley, Massachusetts, where I lived. Uh, there was prejudice. There was uh, a lack of intellectual acumen and energy. Uh, when I came to New York, it, it was just an explosion of, uh, you know, intellectual wonderment. Uh, and I had a lot of Jewish friends. Uh, I moved in those circles, and it was the greatest relief from the sanitized suburb that I had grown up in. And when I heard about Bob's childhood, uh, you know, being in Washington and, uh, you know, doing the things he did with his father, uh, who was, as you say, very illustrious, uh, it, it was very attractive to me because he had a childhood I had always wanted. Once your man started to grow, pretty much everyone you both knew objected to it. This is true. <laughs> this is very true. It was as though the Pope had announced he was going to marry Squeaky Frome. Uh, his cousins were against it. One of them wrote him a letter urging him to see a psychiatrist. Uh, my radical friends thought I was selling out uh, into the establishment. Uh, my mother was uh, passed away, but my father was very supportive. But most people just left us alone. Our, our phones weren't ringing the way they had been ringing. And uh, that brought us closer together. We were kind of a hoarier version of Romeo and Juliet because all we wanted to do was to be together, a, a bastion against this sea of opposition. And it, it, it made us get married earlier than we probably would have. Did you have any misgivings about it yourself? I did. Uh, it, he was not the man of my dreams. Uh, he was the man of my dreams in that I was in love with him. And when you're caught by love, there is nothing you can do. Uh, but he was 30 years older than I was. Uh, I thought about my future. I thought about joining the establishment and wearing the feather boas and the, you know, costumes that people that went to those parties wore. Uh, you know, I thought about I couldn't wear my jeans and, you know, sleep in cold church floors anymore as I was, you know, protesting. And then you thought about that again, and then you say, well, maybe that's not that idea that I won't be sleeping on church floors. <laughs> right, the, cold, <laughs> the cold churches, actually, were, were not the high point of the anti-war movement. Right, right. Uh, but yes, that's right. Uh, and uh, I guess I was ready to move on to another phase right. of my life. Right. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be back with more with Lucinda Franks after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Lucinda Franks, author of Timeless, Love, Morgenthau, and Me, which has just been published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. You go into some detail in your book about your developing romance and even your sexual life. How did, did you, did you okay this with him in advance? Indeed. Okay. He approved every comma and every uh, semicolon. Okay. <laughs> he read many drafts. Okay. And wh what have been the reactions of your family and your friends? Uh, you know, my friends got used to it. Uh, they liked Bob. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his family, you know, very quickly I bonded with his family. Much of the book is about your family life, your trips together, gathering with the family at the family farm upstate, na taking nature walks there, sailing on your boat. You actually sailed around the perimeter of New York State, which sounded really interesting. Your decision to have two children, who seem to have turned out beautifully. Um, so much of your life together seems I'm not going to say all of it, but so much of it seems very idyllic, and you are clearly very smitten with your husband. But there have been ups and downs, uh, times when you thought the marriage was unraveling. This is true, uh, as all marriages. And, and this book is not a 
simply a love story. Uh, it is, of course, a political history of the times and of many of Bob's cases, uh, the inside story of those cases that, that haven't been published, uh, my stories that, that have, you know, been, uh, have made impact. Uh, but it's also about some very serious things that happened to us. And one of them was post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, all our lives, I fought against Bob's emotional barriers. While being very much in love, I felt shut out to a certain extent. Um, you know, to you know, from his very innermost thoughts and feelings, uh, he didn't show emotion very easily, and he uh, was not an emotional person. I uh, I had an episode um, which was very hard. I had breast cancer, early stage, uh, thank goodness, and Bob acted completely counterintuitively. He uh, moved away from me. His daughter, Barbara, came in, was wonderful, helped me, my friends helped me, but he was on the perimeters. He'd come with it, you know, to visit the doctors, but he was absent, and I tried to find out why, and I tried for 18 months to try out to try to find out why he was acting this way and I finally through a therapist and through my own reading realized that he had had a series of traumas serial traumas in his life that had caused post-traumatic stress syndrome now we all think of PTSD as something that soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan, Vietnam get. This is not true. There's only a, a small percentage, I think it's 30% of PTSD sufferers are people that come back from war. Others are people that have shocks one after another. Right. And, and he had had a, 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 a war experience during, you know, yes. that had been very difficult. And he'd also had the death of his right. first wife also from, well, right. from cancer. Yeah, and, and he, well, he was sunk uh, in, in the war uh, by German glider bombs, had to watch while he was in the water for three hours, watch his beloved men go down. He uh, then was fought kamikazes in the Pacific uh, on his destroyer there. He uh, proceeded to have post-traumatic syndrome from those experiences. He would wake up at night with nightmares. He then had to take care of his father, who had hardening of the arteries, and this is a beloved, you know, distinguished father. And that was very hard. His wife uh, got breast cancer, and he had to take care of her for a long, agonizing time. And when I came down with the same thing. He later admitted when we had this talk about PTSD that he thought I was going to die. Mm -hmm. He couldn't reassure me the way I wanted to be reassured because he really thought I was going to die. So was part of getting past this just sort of recognizing it for what it was? No. Uh, I think we had to recognize it for what it was. He had to agree in looking back on his life that indeed this is what it was. And we read from books. Uh, he consulted a therapist. And uh, once he realized this is what was happening to him, he opened up a lot more than he's ever, he ever has before. And this went to prove that what happens with PTSD is it can be cured if people talk mm -hmm. about the experiences over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Part of uh, what suffuses your 
book is, and you mentioned this before, was the great admiration that you feel for him, for his character, his ethics, for the way he goes about his work, for the way he treats other people, for his commitments. Um, and I learned uh, about his pivotal role in creating the Museum of Jewish Heritage uh, downtown, which is such a fabulous place, you know. And I know they had a, um, an exhibit on the Morgenthau family, I think about a, about a year or so ago. Um, you're also a fierce protector of his, uh, as when you write about Leslie Crocker Snyder's <laughs> negative attacks on him when she ran against him for Manhattan DA. I wanted to break her neck. I wanted to cut off all her dumb blonde hair and grind her preppy suits into the muck and pull out her 62-year-old pink teeny bop fingernails. Wow. <laughs> well, wait a minute. What has not been known is what, uh, what was, uh, what, you know, what happened before that. Okay. And that was that she said that Bob Morgenthau was so senile that he had to be propped up during press conferences and whispered, you know, uh, what the press conference was all about. Uh huh. Uh huh. I mean, that was outrageous. Mm. Totally outrageous. Mm -hmm. That's what, <laughs> that's, that's what when, set that off. <laughs> yes, and that was a, a moment. It was, certainly wasn't men. It was a moment of um, anger. Right. Um, what do you consider some of the, I mean, there's so many things that he did. What do you consider some of the high points of his career and some of the low points? Uh, the high points are terrorism. Uh, the case of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, which he succeeded in closing down, was a bank that funded and money laundered for terrorists. Uh, the CIA also used BCCI in order to pay the informers that they paid in the terrorist world. The CIA tried to stop him from investigating BCCI, but he barreled right through and he insisted on doing it. Uh, and the threats that we had over this, uh, the Soros he uh, experienced over this was, was very severe, but he kept on until that bank no longer existed. And that bank, by the way, was also embraced by former presidents. Uh, Jimmy Carter had a credit a card, card right, right. from BCCI mm -hmm. and would travel around with the president of BCCI to third world countries to introduce uh, uh, him, uh, you know, President Carter to uh, third world, uh, you know, people and there was a lot of funny business going on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, we only have about three minutes left, so I'll let the readers read about the low points in the book uh, that you write about. Um, but it seems, though, and you say this is certainly, it's not just a book about uh, a love affair, but it seems to have been and to be a great love affair that you've had. Mm-hmm. Um, he is no longer DA. He left when he was, was he 90 when he 90. decided not to run again? But uh, he went to a law firm. What is he doing now? And what uh, are your lives like now? Well, I asked him when he retired, quote unquote, uh, to come home at about four o'clock every day. Uh, he works for Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen and Katz, a, a very distinguished law firm. He comes home at uh, six o'clock. And I said, well, you promised me four. And he said, well, I'm coming home half an hour early than I used to come home. Uh, he is very involved in immigration reform. He's written many op-ed articles, met with congressmen. He's doing everything he can to stop the uh, abuses against immigrants, which are mammoth. And he is also working with PTSD victims who are not getting the treatment they need to get from the Veterans Administration. What do you want readers to take from the book? I want them to know 
that there is, advan there is an advantage, a big advantage to sticking to your relationships, no matter what they are. That, uh, you know, you have a bad month, you have a bad year, you keep on because there always is something around the corner that will surprise you. There are ways that I, I put in this book of renewing your marriage. And I just think, you know, whether it's your son, your daughter, your niece, your husband, your partner, you need to stick with your relationships and honor your vows. Okay. Well, it's a fascinating book. I learned a lot about him and you. I, I, we're out of time now, but I want to thank Lucinda Franks for joining me today. Timeless, Love, Morgenthau and Me has just been published by Farrar, Strauss and Giroux for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.